Reaching endgame in a new MMO can be a confusing experience, and we're going to try to solve that today. It's been over a month since Endwalker launched. The MSQ is done and dusted. All the content of the initial launch is unlocked. And the next big thing in the horizon is patch 6.1. So what are people doing now? What is Endgame? I mean, the answer kind of is whatever they want. But you might be thinking, seriously, what does the Endgame of FF14 look like now that the game is out and it's thriving? Of course, I'm aware many of us are coming from World of Warcraft, and in the terms of that game, we usually talk about Endgame as being the content currently available to you that is designed for you to do right now, and that ultimately means whatever system of dailies, weeklies, and the patch, dungeons, raids, and reputations. It's what we generally expect, a sort of world where older content is relevant for cosmetics, but that's about it. In FF, it's different. And speaking of cosmetics, by the way, do you want this really kick-ass griffin pin? Well, you can get it over on our Patreon. Yes, uh, if you're subbed there through the end of this month, you will get the January loot, which means you're getting art. You're getting really nice art. We've totally revamped things for this year. And of course, the griffin pin, which is a part of the 2022 pin set that uh, the direction of I just love. Our game's art team are awesome, so uh, yeah, if you want to get the cool stuff, support the channel, then uh, yeah, link down below. All right, back to Final Fantasy. So really, Endgame is simple. FF14 is a broad game that respects your time rather than one that is hyper-diving into a complex loot system designed to last for an extremely long time. The bad luck protection in this game is just awesome. Uh, chores are also not much of a thing. So... Let's run through how FF14 is played and the fun things that you can get up to. Raiding then. Okay, so right now there's effectively six relevant fights in the game, at least for the end game gearing part. There are the two extreme trials and the four pandemonium bosses. So for players who seek a challenge and progression, pandemonium savage is really the real meat of the gameplay. It's where you're going to get the best gear in the game, and most importantly, it's where you'll be mastering the really cool fights. The best way to do this is, of course, with a static, with seven other people. A static, by the way, is just the term that people in FF use to refer to, like, a, a fixed rating team. Now, the party finder is also a pretty damn good option in this game, and actually, many people in FF love to go in blind to experience the fights new, unlike in a lot of other MMOs. Loot and lockouts, then, are quite traditional for Savage. Savage gives you one roll per week per boss. It drops coffers, and that does mean there's always going to be something for you to roll on. And it also drops Mythos, which is the backup currency that can be used to buy gear or to upgrade your Tombstone gear. And for an idea of speed here, the absolute worst case is eight weeks of full clears to fully gear a static and that's, uh, you know, it's a flat eight weeks for everyone to get the mount. Just knowing that's awesome. So generally, a full set of item level 600 gear is a clear and attainable goal. Brilliant. Now do watch out for the lockouts. They're pretty old school. So if you join a P3S group, that's the third boss of Pandemonium Savage, then you'll be locked out of P1S and P2S entirely. And if even just one member of your party has already cleared that boss that week, one loot chest will drop instead of two. And if five or more have cleared it, no loot. So it's a bit more traditional. It does mean no loot carries though, which is probably a good thing. Now, this raid will get a wing of four bosses in patch 6.2 and patch 6.4, assuming past trans hold. And if you're curious, uh, Bwin for L's graphs indicate that about 16 to 20 percent of Japanese players cleared Shadowbringer's final, uh, you know, savage uh, fight. And uh, that number is about 8% for EU and NA. Now, apart from Savage, which is the more hardcore thing, there is, of course, Normal Mode Pandemonium, which you'll definitely be doing on your way up to Savage. The Normal Mode is easier, it drops lesser gear, and it can be re-cleared until you have got at least one loot token from each. Now, then, we've got the max level versions of Endwalker's two trials. These are called Extremes, and they are a stepping stone to the raid gear. They've also got a chance to drop a mount each, which is great, and you can just re-clear them until you've got what you want, which is great. Oh, and also, they're, like, bloody fun, and there's something I want to get into to practice, you know, practice my, uh, my new red mage. As for the rest, well, 
it's now time for me to explain to you tombstones and endgame gear item levels. I find understanding this just helps me almost make that mental infographic of what the gearing looks like. So you start your endgame journey with the item level 560 job gear. Then there are tombstones of aphorism. These are uncapped, you can hold up to 2000 at once, and these can be used to purchase item level 570 gear. Then for the 580 gear, that's Pandemonium Normal and the two extremes, with the first extreme trial dropping accessories and the second dropping weapons. Crafted gear is also 580, by the way. Then we've got Tombstones of Astronomy. Now, these are capped weekly. You can only get so many per week. They buy eye level 590 Radiant gear, and they are mostly used to fill in the gaps in Savage drops for those players, or of course they are BIS for the people who don't do Savage. For Savage then, beyond drops and the Tombstone of Astronomy gear, you also get those Mythos tokens I mentioned earlier. Each boss has its own type of token. Now, when you save these tokens up, you can use them to straight up buy eye level 600 gear, or you can use a smaller amount to upgrade eye level 590 gear to 600. For most people, the overall best in slot gear for their character will be a mixture of the Pandemonium Savage item level 600 gear and then the upgraded Radiant gear from the Mythos. Um, that's just because mixing in, you know, the best stats will just allow for the best stats for your job. Now, capping your Tombstones of Astronomy is not that hard at all. If you do your expert roulette five days, you'll, you'll get it. The trial roulette and main scenario roulette also drop some. What I plan to do though is hunts, and that's because you can do what is referred to as a hunt train, where a group of players just clears the hunt board in around an hour. It's a super fast way of capping that resource, but you will have to have unlocked the hunts by getting second lieutenant in your grand company, which I just recently, well, I'm working towards now. If you don't do Savage, then of course, getting Biss via Astronomy Tomes will take 12 weeks. That's that, just do it. Nice, predictable, chill. Okay, let's move on. FF14's economic gameplay is really big and really deep. Crafters and gatherers have their own currency to worry about called scripts, which they get from gathering specific collectibles from Endwalker zones. They can then turn those scripts in for some decent leveling gear, materia, and materials. But just like how the best battle gear comes from, well, battle, the best crafting and gathering gear comes from doing just that. And it's so cool that this game has got sets of gear for, uh, you know, for those professions. The path to end game for crafters is to level up, then to make or buy themselves a set, a full set of AR Kane gear, uh, two if they're also gatherers, plus an array of tools. Then, for their absolute bis, they need to either earn or buy the materia to get it all pentamelded. Now, the process of pentamelding is not really a complex thing, but it is an expensive thing. Basically, you can put materia on certain gear when it's out of slots, up to five in total. When you're overmelding, there is a progressively lower chance that the materia will stick. Now, if it fails, it shatters. So if your bit of gear has got one guaranteed slot, then bam, you put a materia in that, job's good. But then if you want a second one on it, the success chance starts at 17%, then drops to 10%, then seven, then five for each extra bit. And that means across the average, you'll lose five materia, then nine materia, materia then 14, then 19 to fully meld one of these bits of gear. That's a total of 47 materia lost on average. Now, to make the video a bit more fun, we did some maths, and it turns out on our server, the average damage should be losing 1,200 materia pentamelding for every crafting job, costing you upward of a whopping 24 million gil. You can, of course, use older, uh, cheaper materia, or only meld what you need stat-wise for what you are crafting, or even just level one or two jobs instead of all of them. Now, of course, with all this stuff, the goal is to earn gil by crafting what is profitable. There's a wealth of different materials that come from bicolor gemstones that you get from doing the feints, uh, desynthesizing certain fish, and uh, need to be made in high quality by other crafting jobs. It's a nice thing we're all kind of ties together. 
Uh, there are even then very valuable materials that only come from aphorisms, which are the uncapped tombstone I mentioned earlier. And that means you either need to fork up some cash or pick up your weapon in order to uh, keep a steady supply of those resources. As to how this gameplay really unfolds, uh, it's first by securing your supply of the materials, be that, you know, yourself, a friend, or the market board, then either making your own crafting rotations or finding macros online for your stats to ensure that you can make high quality products. And then it's just crafting stuff all day. Honestly, it's insanely complex and, and deep. They've, they've done a really, really cool job with uh, the crafting professions in this game. And it's something that I really do want to get into eventually. Of course, given the volatility of the market and stuff, really, it's just about being more of a shrewd business person and, uh, you know, working out what to craft. Look, I've not dove into this fully yet, but from where I'm sitting, it does look like one of the most unique and deep crafting systems in an MMO, so I'm very excited. Now then, time for the least designed form of endgame in FF14, and that is the social scene, which is massive. It might sound strange in today's gaming market, but FF14 has managed to actually cultivate an entire breed of player base who are happy to play the game by just picking up a casual outfit, playing the Glamour End game, and just going to a party. Or maybe even hosting a party after spending millions of gil redesigning their house into a cafe, library, or nightclub, or whatever else is possible with the furniture available. This is a completely freeform activity, but it's one that's really taken off in FF14. And that means it's worth talking about because, I mean, this is a real thing to do. This actually happens and is pretty big in FF14. There's almost a joke uh, in here about the true social endgame being to uh, find someone you like and then get married to them in game. Because I guess that's the furthest you can take the social gameplay. Uh, maybe that's not even a joke. Okay, next thing. So far, we've given you a picture of the general Endwalker endgame, I think highlighted in those three pillars of kind of raiding content, um, social, and then the crafting and gathering. But honestly, most people will just do a blend of the above, and then of course throw in doing your daily roulettes to level up maybe an alt uh, job. Really, the philosophy of FF14's endgame is, it's kind of obvious now that I've really seen it unfold. It has a decent bit of depth in every direction, but where it succeeds is in how broad it is and how it lets people basically do whatever they want, even if that means that it doesn't try to cajole them into doing something they don't really want to do. And that's a big strength. The barrier to entry for the activities is really small. Uh, you know, a gear for extremes and a savage doesn't even take that long. And most side content is just a matter of going and doing it. And that does mean that there's sort of an invisible pillar of endgame. Players who don't go hard into any of these activities, but just run a little bit on a few of the treadmills that have been set up in the game. You can log in a few times a week to cap your, uh, your tomes and progress your gear, maybe spend the odd Saturday gathering a bunch of stuff just to make some gill on the side before maybe hitting up a party. It's just a nice blend. Then things like treasure maps and hunts are just fantastic low stress activities that you and your friends can just go and do whenever you want to kill some time, hang out, and of course earn some gill from the material drops. Or maybe other things like ranking up your shared fate ranks by doing a whopping 67 fates in each zone just to unlock things like orchestron rolls or some materials to buy with the bicolor gemstones that you'll get so you can then resell the mats. There's a lot of casual content to do. I mean, even go to the gold saucer. And it's all just a little bit rewarding. So you're always going to get something out of, out of your time. But you also never feel forced to do basically anything. Really, a valid way of enjoying Endgame is to kind of just log out until the next patch. But that being said... If you are new to the game like me, you can experience Endgame with everyone else, but you'll also have a lot of history to catch up on. I know I do. Endwalker being the hot new expansion has in no way diminished the previous four expansions worth of content, which means I literally have a decade of content to catch up on and all at my own pace. Raids, Trials, Alliance Raids, Hildebrand, of course, Eureka, Baja, Job Quests, Crafting, Gathering. 
and the three ultimates that really do seem like their own mountains to climb someday. It's just so cool. And the great thing is that none of this stuff feels outdated when you're doing it. I really love that. I mean, for a start, they've got great stories attached, and that's just timeless. Uh, the other part is that they still just feel, well, they feel relevant as gameplay. Sometimes through maybe doing a minimum item level run, but sometimes through just the regular syncing. I'm told, of course, that they do feel a bit different to their original release, obviously because of potency creep, uh, some redesigns and stuff, but the content basically all does hold up excellently. Then, of course, there's all the other things I could do, like getting relic weapons, or maybe trying to get the Necromancer title from Palace of the Dead. I mean, hell, even Heaven on High, I believe according to the wiki, it actually drops, um, it drops tombstones as well. <laughs> so I guess the, the takeaway here is that Endgame and FF14 can be described as the content intended for players to do when they have finished MSQ. And basically, that's almost everything they've put into the game since 2013, if you're a newer, newer player, especially because they've done a great job of keeping it relevant. So what a great position to be in. There is so much. I just feel the end game of this uh, unfurling in front of me. And that's even before patch 6.1 comes in. It gives me the new crystal PVP system. And uh, of course, the island sanctuary. What a time. What a time to be playing MMOs. So look, if you're like me and you're a newer player, I hope this video just helped you get a few things straight in your head so you can understand what's actually up. Um, this whole video process really helped me understand, and I mean, really, the whole point's been to uh, to help you understand. I hope you found it useful. Of course, if you'd like to support the work uh, that we do, the videos that we make, and also get some cool loot, uh, well, you can check out the Patreon. Uh, really, I mean, the in my head, it's like the pins are like a part of that headline thing. I just, I love a physical item. Um, for art, our team is revamped how we're approaching the art this year, and I just love what they're coming out with. And um, yeah, the, the sort of the class cards, I'm, I'm really liking those. So yeah, art, it, it's cool. It's made by the team that's making our game, so you can check all that out. All right, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy FF14, and I'll see you next time.